Welcome to Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where three cartoonists take an in-depth look at the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz. Hey everybody, welcome back to Unpacking Peanuts. We have a real special treat for you today. We have another Peanuts podcaster in the house, and it is very, very exciting. I'm Jimmy Gownley. You might know me from Amelia Rules, The Dumbest Idea Ever, or Seven Good Reasons Not to Grow Up. Joining me, as always, are my pals and co-hosts and also fantastic cartoonists. He is a composer for both the band Complicated People and this very podcast. He was the original editor of Amelia Rules. He co-created the very first comic book price guide, the Argosy Price Guide. He is the cartoonist behind such great strips as Strange Attractors, Tangled River, and a gathering of spells, Michael Cohen. Be there. And he is the executive producer and writer of Mystery Science Theater 3000. He's a former vice president of Archie Comics, and he is currently creating the fantastic comic strip on Instagram, Sweetest Beasts, Harold Buckholtz. Hello. So, guys, we have to like be on our best behavior today because we have Uh-oh. the OG in the house. We have one of the <laughs> the, the 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 first, I believe, and the and and longest running. Peanuts podcaster, Mr. William Pepper. William, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I'm a little bit disappointed that I'm not the only Peanuts podcaster anymore, but no. but I'm happy you invited me here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we we aim to please and also to destroy, of course. That's just how we are. Uh, Understood. No, your podcast is fantastic, and and we were thrilled to be guests on yours, and, and we're happy to have you here. Yes, thank I you. I appreciate that. So, Bill, uh, tell us your Peanuts origin story. So. I'm a I'm a Gen X kid, born in the 70s. I don't remember not being a Peanuts fan. Uh, I watched all the TV specials as a kid uh, before I could read. Dad would read me the, the comic strips out of the paper, and I would continue to do that as I grew up. When I read the, the funny pages, I, I would prioritize uh, which ones I was going to read first. I read the ones maybe I didn't like as much first and then i always save peanuts for last Mm -hmm. and uh it's just always been a a part of who i am i guess not to get too uh too high about it but uh, yeah i I don't remember not being a peanuts fan uh now was there a certain aspect of it that you were drawn to more than the others like was it the strip itself did you were you primarily an animation fan as you were a kid or i probably was an animation fan i really liked the films I like the TV specials. As far as the Daily Strip, uh, I was uh, I was a Charlie Brown fan. I mean, he was the star basically at one point, and I like to see what he would get up to. I guess I resonated with him the most, probably. And w- what was it about him? I liked. It's it's a corny answer, but the same answer everybody gives. I like that uh, you know, you knock him down, he always gets up again, and. Uh, I think while early Charlie Brown, going back to the early days of the strip where he's kind of the wise guy, uh, sort of jokester kind of guy, he was okay. But but I, I like, you know, I like the Charlie Brown that maybe is a little more wishy-washy, and, and, but still true to himself, you know, knows what he believes. Absolutely. You know, a lot of people, I think it's not so much a strip about failure. It's a, it's a strip about constantly trying, you know, and, and uh, you know, you're, sometimes you're a, a uh, glass half full person. Sometimes you're glass half empty, and sometimes you're just happy you have a glass. Uh, and, <laughs> exactly. And, and I think that's 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 interesting. That that's the part that resonated with you. That's a huge part that resonated with me as well. Yeah. What when you saw those earlier strips, though, the ones where he was the wise guy? What what mm-hmm. did you think of those the first time you saw them? I thought, well, I noticed how different they were. Um, as a kid, other than reading the strip, I would I would get the collections of like the uh, faucet rest books, I think. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the collections, and I would sit there on a Saturday afternoon, I would read them, and I was always kind of drawn to those early ones because they looked so different and uh, and had such a different feel to them that I appreciated them, but they almost felt like a different strip Very than much. what I was seeing in the, in the daily newspaper, you know. So uh, I appreciated it for for that. Just being something different. Yeah, yeah, very much. And Peanuts maintained though its uh, its difference all all the way through. It's so strange though when you look back at those early strips, because in, in especially the very early ones, 
they're they're absolutely radically radically different. Do you have yeah. though a favorite era? Well, sometimes when I when I answer that question, I say that that is my favorite only in the sense that it is so different. It it has such a different feel to it that um, in a way it is kind of my favorite. Although as far as um, you know, day to day, boom, hitting the mark every time, good strip. I got to go, and it's not original. I got to say the '60s probably. All right. Um, uh, you know, nothing original about that answer, but Schultz really was. You know, he was 10 years in, and he he was on top of his game, and uh, it's hard to deny that. Yeah, one of the things that's really has struck me when we're doing this reread, read, where you know we're doing it from the beginning, is that 10 years is a long time. You know, yeah, Ka- Calvin Hobbes was over in 10 years. Right. Uh, I don't know how long did the far side run. I think that was 10 years, right? What about uh what about Bloom County? How long did that? Oh, run? yeah, Bloom County ended in after like 9 or 10 years. Yeah, I think it's around yeah. the same time. So it seems like that's the point where you're going to hit burnout. And you know, no right. judgment to those guys because it is a grind to do yeah. a daily comic strip. I can't imagine. But it's it's so shocking to see Schultz just seeming to get more and more energized as these first years go by. It's really exciting. I feel like it wasn't a, an issue of becoming energized. I think he'd kind of been living his whole life to get to that point, you know? Right. It was kind of just, it, obviously there was the, the practical aspects of having to go to the drawing board every day and, and do the thing and, and all the other stuff that comes with doing a popular strip. Cause of course he had to deal with you know, licensing stuff and eventually animation stuff and all of this on top of doing the daily strip. But I think for him, it wasn't work really. It was just kind of him putting his his mind out on the page, you know, blood and sweat, almost literally, you know? Yeah, it, it's clearly, there are a few instances where someone has, is so suited to their profession, to their calling, really, uh, and yeah. to the moment, if you can call 50 years a moment, yeah, as Schultz was. Yeah. But that's definitely, definitely all true. So yeah. was there a part point in your life though where maybe peanuts drifted away and you weren't, weren't yeah. paying attention to it? Honestly, uh, when Garfield first came out, mm-hmm. all right. uh, I was a little, and how old I was were a little you kid. Yeah. Well, I, that's what I was going to say. I was probably, what was that? 78, 79. 78, yeah. So I was like seven. Yeah. Um, and er, when Garfield first came out, it was, everybody was reading Garfield. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was, it was, you know, the first however many years it was really a really funny um really kind of unique strip and i had i i didn't stop getting the peanuts books or anything but but i focused more of my allowance money on the collections of the garfield strips yeah Mm -hmm. or you know collecting the toys or whatever and for a while that was probably my focus yeah i think people people forget you know who are people or people who weren't around in 1978 I think we think of Garfield as something that's very slick. We were talking on your podcast about Mort Walker and Beetle Bailey, how it kind of became an yeah. industry. Uh, and it, it was like a, and everything's been, um, I don't know how you put it, but it's been standardized so that, that when you see a Garfield strip, you know what you're going to get every day. But man, in 1978, he looked more like, the, like those Clyburn cats. Uh, originally, he looked very yeah. different and the humor was very fresh and it, it's this kind of, it, you, you have to go back to those original strips to kind of recreate the excitement that that happened when it was first out there. There was nothing like it. And John was a cartoonist at the beginning. Oh yeah, yeah. I still remember the. the I guess it was the first strip, right? Where it's it's John the cartoonist is in the strip. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's sort of uh, breaking. I don't know. Breaking the fourth wall is the right term, but yeah. Um, but yeah, it was very different. I still maintain that the big mistake Jim Davis made was getting rid of the Lyman character <laughs> oh i don't remember that as well i don't i i was never i i you know what i did like about garfield though and i wonder if you were because we're probably around the same age yeah do you remember the cbs saturday morning show yeah kind of yeah. I, I thought did, that I was did, an amazing because the yeah. 80s tv animation was a little dicey Ooh. i thought they did an amazing rough. job yeah. with that though yeah absolutely but uh so yeah garfield occupied my attention for quite a while uh and how did it drift back to peanuts no, no disrespect to Jim Davis, but I, I kind of got to a point with Garfield where I felt like I, I've seen this already uh, the last 40 out of the last 50 days. Right. Uh, to my mind, 
pretty much the same strip. So I, maybe I'm maybe I'm kind of done with Garfield now. It, but Peanuts, I could always go back to Peanuts, and I still read Peanuts during all this time. Mm-hmm. But and there's all there was always something new. I mean, the format was of Peanuts was kind of the same, but within that format, he had so many characters. He had so many. He could do a, a just a, a gag one day, and the next day he's uh, trotting out Thoreau or a Bible quote or right. uh, uh, Lucy's pulling the football away or, or you know, whatever. Format always the same, but within that format, he could do so much, and I could always find something to enjoy. So it was not hard to come back. Yeah, well, that's exactly that expresses exactly what I like and admire most about Schultz is that you get these four tiny little rectangles, and somehow he puts magic in every single one of them every single day. It's it's breathtaking and mind blowing. Yeah. Spoiler for people listening: we already had a conversation earlier today. And we were talking about how uh, I asked a question about could Schultz have done anything else if he decided to close up shop with peanuts? Uh, you know, if I if I drifted away in the late 70s to Garfield and there was no peanuts to come back to, would there have been another Charles Schultz strip in, in its place? And I don't know that there would have been because uh, I think he invested everything in this one strip and, and was able to do so much with it that uh that he couldn't really have done anything else. And he was always going to be there uh, for me when I came back. Yeah. You know, and it's so poetic. Then he ultimately passes at the same time the strip passes. I mean, it's, that's a, like a, a that's like a myth, you know, like or a legend. That that would still, happen yeah. That's still remarkable to me. If you, if you wrote that in a novel, right. People would say, Oh, that's, that's a cliche contrivance, thing. but it really happened. Right. And, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I want to give a spoiler for my take on the last strip, but I won't because we still have 17,000 more to read. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but I can't yeah. wait to so, talk about the last strip. I can't, can't wait for 2024 uh, <laughs> for that episode. Yeah. So, okay. So you're grow. where are you growing up again? I'm sorry. Uh, Iowa. Iowa, Midwest. right. Oh, Burke, yep. Breathed, uh, co- so that's, that's Midwest. Yep. Schultz is Midwest. Yep. yep. Harold is Midwest. Yeah. Yeah. We're all good people. Do you see any of that in the strip? I do. You guys on your podcast have talked about Schultz as a Midwesterner and how you see that in the strip. When you look at interviews of Schultz or, or read an interview of Schultz, you definitely see he's got the, the characteristically Midwestern thing about him. He's very uh, self deprecating. He's very, I was going to say, very polite. Not the people in other parts of the world aren't polite, but we're very polite here in the Midwest. Uh, it's what makes us special. But at the same time, I've lived here now for, for over 50 years. And uh, and I get it when people say, oh, that's very Midwestern. But it's also not not everyone in the Midwest is, is like what people think Charles Schultz is like. I tortured that something. I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> We're not all self-deprecating and, and polite to a fault and all of that. As far as whether I see Midwestern in the strip, one thing that always interested me as a kid when I would read the strip, I, and I had some idea you know, about who Schultz was and stuff, and I knew he lived in California, but he would do these, so in my head, the characters all live in California. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one thing I would notice is uh, in the winter, it would snow in Peanuts World. And it snows in the Midwest, but it doesn't snow in California, typically. So, yeah, that's a very superficial example, but I could see the Midwestern in that. Right. Um, a spo- by the way, we we found out, this is recorded before our episode will be released, but we've discovered where Peanuts takes place. No way. Yeah, yeah. yeah really? Was, yeah. I, I'm, is it by Colorado? Way, I, I mean me, you know, whatever. No big deal. <laughs> no big, but... Anyway, yeah. is, is it is it Colorado? No, it's uh. Oh, I can't remember. It's Hennepin it? County, Hennepin County, Minnesota. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I've been there. Oh, yeah. there you go. There uh, you I go. actually was I actually was born in Minnesota, not Hennepin County, but I, I was born in Minnesota. Oh, okay, uh, great. Yeah, I, I so uh, I, one thing I think about William when I think of the strip because I I think I uh, when we were talking with Lex Fajardo, um, I may have brought this up, but you know I, I was a kid who was visiting. 
Southwest Missouri and, and Oklahoma when I was uh, you know, growing up. And I was actually, most of my life I was living, like in my young life was in Rochester, New York, um, from the age of four to 11. And so I was coming from that perspective into the Midwest and in experiencing the differences firsthand for, you know, a week every six months or so. And that it struck me how different it was. I, I, I was not expecting um, you know, the United States to me, I thought, well, all the United States was the United States. And, but there was something about the, the, the Midwest. And, and I was struck by how maybe one way to put it is um, Schultz is drawing these comics in these tiny little boxes. And maybe that's something about the Midwest is that they might work within tighter bounds than what artists in New York and L.A. would in terms of what the content is, how you approach it. Uh, it's a little more it's a little more reserved there's a few more rules that you set with for yourself of what you do and what you don't do and we've certainly Jeez, heard about- just say it uptight we get it <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it well and there's a, and it, 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 okay. well i was just saying that, that it was um there's there's this kind of principled nature to schultz that he sets these things for himself these boundaries for himself that no one would even think of in the, the, the strips of most of the members of the national cartoonist society they're like, you know, who is this? Who is this you know, uptight guy? This, uh, this rube, as I think uh, Mort Walker once once referred to somebody said said to him yeah. from yeah. from uh, Minnesota. He's 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 different, but he's he sets these these boundaries, which in a way makes him more accessible. I think because in a way, it, what he won't go into are some of the some of the, the crazier aspects of life that maybe would make some people uncomfortable. But giving himself the, the, those boundaries, he he became more universal somehow. Yeah, well, that's the story of Schultz, I think, is that boundaries uh, and limitations enhance his creativity beyond. So I wonder how different the strip would have been then if uh, Schultz had grown up in New York. Well, I think that's, that's what's really fascinating. And maybe we'll be looking at this in, in years to come as we're going through these strips is he did move to California in 19, was it 58? Um, and yeah. like that, and yeah. so he's experiencing the California lifestyle. And I think you do see it in the strip. I think he starts to loosen up and open up uh, in the late 60s and early 70s in ways that he may not have if he had stayed in Minnesota. Sure. Right. No, I was going to say Schultz is an interesting guy to me. And I guess this kind of relates to that in the sense that he is very polite. He's very self-deprecating. He's very reserved. But also when you listen to him talk or you uh, you read an interview, you you also see that he is very confident in his work. Yeah. And he is very. He knows he's great. He knows he's great. And he yeah. doesn't have to yeah. lord it over he anyone. Honestly does. He's stubborn, he, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. He, he, he knows he's good at what he does. He's not going to change what he does. But if you ask him about himself, he'll poke fun at, at himself or whatever. But if you mention his yeah. work, he's going to give you a very clear, this is exactly what needs to happen with this. And this is how I'm doing it. And, and, this is great yeah yeah it's there's something about him it makes me think like he's the person who brought like dignity to cartooning even though that's unfair i mean there were cartoonists who were celebrities yeah uh you know that but there's something he crazy he celebrities always <laughs> what's that crazy celebrities maybe they weren't bringing dignity to comics even though well that's famous. true right exactly yeah, <laughs> that's true i guess that is a very different thing yeah yeah, because he definitely, you know, I that was the he was the kind of cartoonist I wanted to. I I um I'm as I get older too, and getting crazier and and more sentimental. I, it's almost like I feel you should bow to your art desk before you start <laughs> trying, because it's unbelievable that you get to do this. Yeah, you know what what a what a what a gift that you get to do this, yeah. even if it stinks to draw and your hand hurts and whatever. It's miserable. It a still beats having a real job. <laughs> And and B, you get to do that. That's that's wonderful. And I, I think he just exuded that. Yeah. yeah. And I think he's I a, think artists love him for that. Yeah. He's a fascinating guy. Uh, he really the is. Depth, the depth. Uh, hey, but s- yes, you're a fascinating guy, too. So I want to know, <laughs> well, thank you. how do you then go from being a fan to a wayward fan to coming back to saying, all right, I'm going to do a podcast well, a- about this topic? So in about 2015, I actually started listening to podcasts. And uh, and I do some writing and so forth. But around that time, I was in a, a bit of a creative lull with my writing. And I, for some reason, I immediately thought, 
podcast. I think I could do that. And the first, the first show I, I started actually and still do uh, is called Atari Bytes, where every uh, episode I talk about an old Atari video game, and then I present an original short story by me that really doesn't have anything to do with the game. Sometimes the game is a writing prompt for me to go off and write whatever I want to write. Oh, cool. Uh, so I, I started doing that episode or that podcast that still comes out every other Sunday. But I was still a listener to podcasts, and I was still looking for things to listen to. And I thought, well, I like Peanuts. Uh, surely there are a bunch of Peanuts podcasts out there that I can listen to, to, to revel in my joy of <laughs> Snoopy and 50-odd years of, of content. And what I discovered right away is, uh, yeah, no, there's not. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of podcasts that will do an episode during the holiday season about a Charlie Brown Christmas. Um, mm-hmm. But that's about it. So I thought, all right, I guess I'll do it. Even though I have no particular cred, I have no uh, credentials to do so. I'm not a cartoonist. Uh, I'm not an artist. I, I don't have any particular knowledge of, didn't have any particular knowledge of Peanuts, other than I had read the script forever. But I just decided, okay, I'm going to do it. So I did, and I started it in uh, 2016. Yeah, I mean, you you are you are a writer, William, and, yeah. and I think that, that could, really comes through in the in the podcast that you're. Say you're covering a, an episode of, of a TV series. Of, yeah, and you're, so I mostly you're, you're bringing a, an artist an artist perspective as a writer to how they're structuring the work. Who who's the character? Who's has the through line in this particular story, who's the pr- protagonist, which is actually a very hard thing to do with some of these episodic uh, Peanuts shows. Yeah. And it's fascinating to hear your perspective. I made the decision early on to start at least with the, the animated stuff, because I thought being a podcast, that would be a way I could, you know, I could uh, for review purposes, I could borrow some sound clips, get some audio in there, maybe make it a little more engaging that way. And I was a little uncertain if I could talk about the scripts uh, in an intelligent way on their own. Uh, I did start shortly after the podcast started uh, a segment called Random Strip of the Month, where I invite people, or I do it myself, uh, to uh, send in an audio submission of themselves talking about a particular strip. Because I wanted, I wanted, basically, I do in microcosm what you guys do for an entire episode. I pick a strip or somebody picks a strip and read it, talk about what it is, what's good about it, if there's anything not so good about it, what's not so great about it. Uh, because I wanted to make sure when I was doing talking about all this animated stuff that we didn't forget, there wouldn't be any animated stuff if there wasn't 50 years of, of newspaper strips. So I have tried to consciously make that more of a, a focus of the show. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, I've noticed. I, I've I've known Michael and Harold for 20 some years each, uh, but I've learned things about them that I didn't know because of this podcast and because of discussing this work in such depth. And perhaps more amazingly, I feel like I've learned things about myself. You know, see whether I saw some behavior in the characters or I, I felt a resonance with something Schultz was going, trying to say or whatever. Has being immersed in peanuts, do you feel it has had some sort of effect on you as a person, other than just filling time as a podcast? What, what has it changed within you? Oh, boy. Um, or even just something that you noticed that was always there that yeah. maybe now it's brought yeah. to the fore. Doing the podcast, well, doing the podcast has made me uh, think more about peanuts as a whole, not just a strip on a page not just a uh, a Flash Beagle TV special. Uh, it would be mm. sad to base all of Peanuts just on Flash Beagle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Poor Flash Beagle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I have consciously made a decision to step back and look at everything. That's how I started the show. I said, I'm going to cover everything, whether it's uh, a TV special, a comic strip, uh, something going on in Charles Schultz's life. Whatever it is, if somebody writes a book about peanuts. I want to talk to that person. So, so I guess that's what it's done for me. I always was a fan of the script. That was usually how, as far as it went. I would read it and I think, oh, that's kind of funny or, or that's a, an interesting reference. And then I was done for the day. I wanted to, with this podcast, think more about, uh, the work as a whole. And I've gotten to do that. So that's, that's been pretty cool. 
I have a question. Yeah. Um, on the first podcast of yours I listened to, you mentioned that your kids are huge Peanuts fans, but oh, they've never read I, the strip. Yeah, I was lying. What? what, what? <laughs> um, really? <laughs> no, no, I wasn't lying. <laughs> Honestly, I wasn't lying. Maybe. Okay. Um, but my question yes. is, uh, what what do you think their reaction would be if they went back and read the strip? I I, I think they would kind of shrug and say, yeah, that, that was kind of funny. Dad, thanks for showing that to me. And I go back and do what I was doing now. Um, okay. No, only because. Well, see, that's when you start browbeating. <laughs> if I, you take away, you take away the... I, a lot of people have have thrown browbeating aside as a tool for communication, but I find it works. You just take away their phones and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but but only be, not because of peanuts, but because I mean, they're my kids are uh, sixteen and twelve. They didn't grow up reading the funnies in the paper. Comic strip as a medium for them doesn't resonate at all. It's not a thing that they're interested in. It's not a, a thing that they, they want. They will at the during the holidays, whatever the holiday is, they will, uh, you know, say, "Okay, Dad, time to watch uh, Charlie Brown Christmas or, or <laughs> Halloween or whatever." They're keeping track of where Arbor Day is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or Arbor Day, or, or the four, however many Valentine specials there were. <laughs> But I think they're doing that more because they know that I like it. I don't think, I don't know that, they don't dislike Peanuts, but it doesn't, it doesn't inform who they are. Well, could I ask you, William, based yes. on your experience with uh, the podcast, who is, who is resonating to what you're doing with people? Do you see any, th any, any similarities in the people other than a love of Peanuts that seems to be a part of, who, who is interested in, in what you're doing with the peanuts on a podcast? You're saying as far as the, the feedback that I get from listeners? Yeah. What do you see? A, do you see commonalities in, in the type of people who, who are really interested in, in, uh, in peanuts and, and discussing peanuts? I do only in the sense that they are all about my same age, Gen mm. X people. Uh, I don't know why. I suppose maybe that's because that's a lot of who listen to podcasts, maybe. I have had on occasion, I, I hear from like an 18 or 19 year old fan, uh, but it's mostly, uh, it, yeah, it's mostly people around my age, you know, 40s or 50s. That's uh, interesting. That yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, our own voices are obviously mixed in with what we do in these podcasts and that, that also has its own attractions. I don't know if a, if you had a really excited uh, 18 year old who did their own podcast, what kind of an audience they would, they would attract, you know, how much of it is peanuts and how much of it is, you know, your voice that, yeah. that just determines who, who is going to resonate and come back and be involved. I would like to hear that podcast. Actually. I hope somebody will do that. Me um, too. You know, just to, uh, if and nothing we'll else, then to, crush them. <laughs> <laughs> it's best to we learn. We invite young. you to try my friends. We invite you to try. No. Yeah, exactly. Well, we gave you an impossible task. You, you really did. Which was to select your five favorite, five most interesting, whatever. Yes. You're going to talk about five and only five peanut strips. Yep. So um, the next half of the show, we are going to discuss those in depth, as is our want. But before we do that, I just kind of wanted to uh, uh, get your take on how did you select these and how difficult was it? So it, it was extremely difficult. The, the, the remit that I got was uh, pick your five favorites and my brain immediately blanked completely on what peanuts even is. Um, <laughs> I, I, I got a deer in the headlights kind of feeling about it. It's like, uh, I, I don't know. Um, but then I decided to step back a little bit and I thought, okay, instead of trying to pick five favorite strips, I'm going to pick maybe a, a variety of types of strips or tones or whatever because I could make an interesting conversation. A couple of these. I thought, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. But I was just like, you, you were going to say, okay. initially I came up with five spike strips. I said, that's just a little too, <laughs> that's a little too on the nose. Let's, uh, let's open it up. Uh, five, five, five of uh, Shermie's best, uh, <laughs> best strips. That could be another episode. A couple of these I, I really did have in mind and thought, okay, I want to, uh, I want to talk about that. One in particular. One of them, I actually have to credit a listener to my show, actually. Uh, when we get there, I'll give her credit for it because she brought it to my attention. 
right before you guys asked me to come up with some scripts. So I stole this one from her because <laughs> it, it fit yeah, with, with what I was looking for. So, so that was my approach. Uh, I went for types of strips. Probably if you ask me again next week, I'd probably fit five different ones. <laughs> you know, for sure. So, well, this is great. So how about we take a break right here and then uh, we come back and we discuss Bill's uh, picks in depth. Sound good? Sounds good. Great. Sure. All right. We'll be right back. Hey, we're back here at Unpacking Peanuts, talking with William Pepper, who is the host of It's a Podcast, Charlie Brown, the longest running and first Peanuts podcast. And it's a fantastic listen. If you haven't uh, given it a listen yet, please, please do. So, Bill, we are going to talk to you about these five strips. And uh, how about we just get to it? Sounds good. December 8th, 1952. Charlie Brown and Violet are sitting outside with some sort of toys around them. Violet says, is that the only t-shirt you own? Charlie Brown stands up and looks down at his shirt. He says, why? What's the matter with it? Violet says, it's that stripe. I'm tired of seeing it. Charlie Brown walks away saying, I'm sorry, I didn't know it bothered you. I'll go home and change. In the last panel, we see Charlie Brown. He's back. He has the exact same shirt on, only it is now inverted with a white stripe instead of a black stripe. And he says, how's this? <laughs> All right, tell us about that. So this is the strip. I have to give credit to Lynn, who's one of my listeners. She uh, actually submitted this as a random strip of the month <laughs> for one of my shows. And when I saw it, I thought, this is a great strip. She submitted it to me because I've commented on my podcast that I, I, this is more of an issue for the animated special, but I don't, like it, I find it unsettling when the peanuts characters aren't wearing their traditional clothes. Um, <laughs> for some reason, it weirds me out a little bit if Charlie Brown is wearing a red shirt instead of a yellow one, or uh, you know, Linus has a different outfit on or something. Mm -hmm. But in this case, this is a gag, and I think it works. So I'm not weirded out by this. <laughs> <laughs> so just to put everybody at ease. I'm okay. Um, All right. Oh, good. 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 I was worried. <laughs> uh, there, but there's some interesting things here. Uh, this is 1952. We're a couple of years into the strip at this point, give or take. Charlie Brown, is, the characters are starting to look a little bit more like what we expect them to look like. Uh, they're still on the younger side, uh, these two anyway, I think. But, uh, but Charlie Brown is still, I don't know if he's quite being a wise guy here, but he's being a jokester a little bit, having some fun with Violet. So you, uh, you think in this strip, William, that Charlie Brown is aware that this, <laughs> this this shirt is is not fulfilling her needs. He's he's just joking with her versus innocently switching to a different shirt. But it it doesn't. I can I can I can see the strip both ways. And now now that you said, I'm looking at Charlie Brown in the last panel, and I'm looking at the expression on his face, and I'm trying to figure out it. It, it would probably fit my interpretation more if he had a little bit more of a uh, ha ha gotcha kind of expression <laughs> on his face. And he doesn't really. He's just smiling and saying, how's this? So I could see the I can understand the interpretation that says he was being accommodating to Violet. Although I don't know why, because Violet is a horrible person. Um, <laughs> well, there's that's my story right, right there. <laughs> but so I can understand that interpretation. I prefer to read it and thinking about the era that the strip is from. I think it's more him uh, messing with Violet a little bit. <laughs> There's so many strips that that you can read both ways, particularly in those early instances. And it's so funny because Michael and I are is like, oh, no, he's definitely being a jerk. And Harold's like, I don't think so. I think it's the picture of innocence. <laughs> and I get it. But, you know, Violet, I, I said she's a horrible person. That's maybe a little mean. But <laughs> Violet's a little mean throughout her run. Uh, Super mean. And I, she is she's she's sort of the prototype Lucy. But with Lucy, Schultz figured out how to make her mean, but also give her a little bit of a, in the sun's bad, a little bit of a soul, you know? Yeah, she's likable. Yeah. yeah. Violet is just all well, Violet was very, hostility. She was started out very sweet in this period, but, you know, we, we were theorizing it was sort of a comment on his marriage. And this is a very yeah. wifey thing to say to sort of 
I'm tired of you wearing that shirt. Yeah, right. I heard you guys talk about that on, on the show, and when I heard that, I thought, oh, yeah, this could absolutely be a a, a, a reference to what was going on with Schultz at that time. So yeah, I can absolutely see that. August 14th, 1960. It's a Sunday. It's a beautiful day. Puffy clouds in the sky. Lucy says to Charlie Brown and Linus, aren't the clouds beautiful? They look like big balls of cotton. We see the three kids lying on a mound, staring up at the sky. Lucy says, I could just lie here all day and watch them drift by. She points up at the clouds and says, if you use your imagination, you can see lots of things in cloud formations. What do you think you see, Linus? Linus answers, well, those clouds up there look to me like the map of the British Honduras and the Caribbean. Charlie Brown raises his head, a blank look on his face. Linus continues, that cloud up there looks a little like the profile of Thomas Eakins, the famous painter and sculptor. Linus continues, Charlie Brown now looks completely baffled. As Linus says, and that group of clouds over there gives me the impression of the stoning of Stephen. I can see the Apostle Paul standing there to one side. Lucy says, "Uh uh-huh, that's very good. What do you see in the clouds, Charlie Brown? Charlie Brown answers, well, I was going to say I saw a ducky and a horsey, but I changed my mind. (laughs) I'm laughing. He did say I saw a ducky and a horsey. (laughs) This is famous. I mean, this is beloved. Yeah. Uh, The punchline punchline kills me every time. I don't care how many times I read this. I like strips. As a kid, I always liked the strips where a character made a reference to somebody. Lucy talking about Liv Ullman or Linus in particular <laughs> uh, with a philosopher or a biblical quote or uh, somebody references some historical event. And as a kid, I had no idea what they were talking about in this strip. I still don't exactly know uh, the, the map of the British Honduras and the Caribbean. I couldn't <laughs> tell you what that looks like. <laughs> but I liked it when they did that because it made me feel like I was reading something sophisticated, you know, <laughs> I wasn't just reading a comic strip. In the, in the news. I wasn't reading, sorry, you know, Bailey. Right. Yeah. I was reading. We're reading something sophisticated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, listen, that, I mean, that viewpoint validates basically my entire life. And I have so many arguments with editors and publishers <laughs> who are like, a kid doesn't get that. Well, then a kid will learn. Yeah. Like uh, if you're only ever approaching people with things they already know, I mean, I invite you to imagine how absurd that is. Yeah. It, the communication ceases to exist. And I, I agree. I, I think it just adds to it, no matter how much you understand or don't understand. Yeah, I was so happy to see you you select this strip, William, because I I, I was thinking about this um, just a week or so ago, and of this, I haven't read anywhere near seventeen thousand eight hundred ninety seven strips that represent the body of Schultz's work. But right now, this is the one that has to be knocked out of the number one strip of all time in my mind. Uh, oh wow. wow that is a bold statement that and we just broke some news here folks that's exciting <laughs> so flash, you think that is gonna be be of good cheer wow <laughs> all right flash okay. forward to that episode uh when you get to this strip and he decides that he hates it so <laughs> <laughs> i've been thinking about it forget it well uh, it's gonna be hard to top this for best best strip of 1960 but we'll see it's it, it is uh kind of reminiscent uh, a little bit of the 60s, too. Sort of this approach of, uh, you know, stop and look at the clouds. and Aren't they pretty? And, oh, what's that look like? And that kind of stuff. So Yeah, it is weird. Yeah, it's a very philosophical era for, era for him, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, he was so close to the zeitgeist for so long. Yeah. That, that alone, yeah. that's hard to do as just a person. Yep. Yeah. Walking around, let alone to be an artist trying to reflect the culture back to itself. Absolutely. What are these kids doing outside on a hill? I mean, yeah, kids aren't going to relate to this. Why? Why are they just lying there doing nothing? <laughs> <laughs> well, my kids now, especially, wouldn't relate to this. Uh, another reason why, I, I, unfortunately, I don't know that it would resonate the same way with them. Um, William, have, have you the, ever the, seen Gregory's Girl? I don't the, think so. That, that that's what I think of the the culture reflecting back on this strip. That's what I think of. There's a scene where two people are lying on lying in the, in a park in their backs, looking up in the sky and 
yeah, totally resonates with what Schultz was doing here. A lot of the, uh, the, the animation stuff, when they try to recycle strips into the animations, didn't always capture the same feel. But in a, a, the film, A Boy Named Charlie Brown, they use this strip yeah. as the opening of the film. And I, I think it's really nice. They do a really nice job with it. Yeah. I mean, comics um, aren't storyboards, but in this instance, right. they essentially are. <laughs> you know, it, it was yeah. it was perfect for that that piece of animation. I, I love yeah. that, too. Yep. But luckily, yep. not luckily, but he has a character who this is totally and right fits with, with yeah. Linus. No one else could say this. No. Absolutely. Yes. Now to, that would. Uh, so it passes the Shermie test for sure. Absolutely. Because if, <laughs> if you had Shermy saying this about the clouds, that would not track <laughs> as as something possible. You know what else I like? I like how Lucy just goes with it. Uh-huh, that's very good. Like, oh, come on, Lucy. You don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, and what's with exactly. Lucy's dress that it's like it's yep. like it's a bustle. It, it, it never changes its <laughs> shape when she's lying on her back. She's she's wearing armor or something. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, you know, as a cartoonist, that's a hard thing to do, to draw the yeah. same thing over and over with minimal changes. You know, now, of course, well, we would do it with Photoshop. And even I would be like, yeah, I'm not drawing that every time. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot of things about these characters that I, I don't draw, but I, I imagine shouldn't work. Oh, yeah. I and mean, they have these giant heads and the and the short arms and legs and stuff. Bill Melendez talked about that doing the animations, trying to figure out how to make that work. Uh, on the screen, but even on the page, these characters look so different than uh, anything that came before. Well, you know, uh, at the the fact that the characters just shouldn't work visually leads us into your next strip uh, quite neatly. So here we go. July 12th, 1965. We see Snoopy laboring to carry a case behind him. Then in panel two, he's pushing it forward. In panel three, we see him opening up as he has brought it to his doghouse. In panel four, he is atop the doghouse. We see that what he was carrying was a typewriter, and he is typing the words, It was a dark and stormy night. The famous novel opening. This is, but is this the first him yeah. sitting on the doghouse typing? My understanding is this, well, at least it's the first time he used the, it was a dark and stormy night. Right. Yeah. I don't know about the first time typing. And, of course, it's the famous opening line from the 1830 novel, Paul Clifford, which I've never read. And uh, it's also the first line of, I think, A Wrinkle in the Time. Really? Oh, wow. So th these are some Peanuts obscurities we'll have to explain. Yeah. Well, Wrinkle in Time, which was written by Albert Payson Terhune. Um, <laughs> I'm going to Google that because uh, you have to listen to our episode Dude. with William. Dude on it's a podcast charlie brown because i'm pontificating about the, no one respecting steve ditko and his creation of uh <laughs> the peacemaker character and then michael had to tell me i was completely wrong uh so while we're doing this i'm i'm gonna google some stuff right now about a dark and storming night you guys keep uh, talking I, okay. I think i think jimmy we we can tell you pretty confidently that steve ditko didn't write a wrinkle in time. <laughs> oh now i'm destroyed twice <laughs> And give me credit for not calling you a blog. <laughs> so I like this one. I don't know where this strip falls in the development of all of uh, Snoopy's alter egos or personalities. But for me, the kid who was who was sitting in the basement with his mom's portable typewriter uh, writing ripoffs of Encyclopedia <laughs> Brown, um, Snoopy as a as, uh, world-famous author, that's the one that resonated with me more than uh, Flying Ace or Go Cool. Or, uh, I like all those guys too. But this guy, the famous author, uh, was what resonated to me. So that's why I picked it uh, to go here. I just, uh, I, I love it every time Snoopy uh, is writing some weird novel. <laughs> uh, and then Lucy will tell him, no, you got to have more action. And he'll write something and in the back and forth. And, and, you know, mailing his. Uh, publications off to a publisher and getting back the rejection letters you know you know what maybe just don't bother to send it to us we're going to reject <laughs> it right now stuff like that oh this is uh, that all resonated with me as a kid especially resonates with me as an adult uh I, yeah I, it I kind of this. gave that when i tried to send in a comic strip to syndicates way back in the 90s 
there was this badge of honor by getting the rejection slip because of these peanut strips. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, I, I did something like Snoopy did. This is amazing. I got back a rejection slip. So you were talking about the yep. visual aspect of the characters. Uh, and if you look at this, if you look at Snoopy in those last three panels, he completely changes his anatomy for what the drawing needs to be. <laughs> and nobody cares. And in yeah. panel two, he doesn't even have a tail. And Oh, you're right. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, because it would have blur it would have cluttered up the movement, it would have cluttered up the design. So it's just like, oh, we'll leave it tucked in. And yeah. you know, those legs don't match the dog's rear legs that are in a panel three, yeah. which then turn back into more human style legs in panel four. If you were do if you were designing a character, a lot of kids will go on, you know, YouTube and they'll watch every video how to design a character, how to do this, how to do that. <laughs> Yeah, they're not going to yep. teach you that. No, that's right. And the third panel, he's got a thumb. And then the fourth panel, he's got right. fingers instead of a thumb. So right. it's all, yeah, the, the magic of Snoopy. Every single drawing is iconic and beautiful and, and different than the one before it. <laughs> How does he do that? But now, this leads Absolutely. me to a, a really interesting question that I have not contemplated before. Okay, so, Bill, this is your favorite iteration of Snoopy. Michael and Harold, yeah. at, this, at least at this stage, what you know, what is your favorite version of Snoopy? This one isn't far off from the late 50s, early 60s one. He's, 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 he's not quite as elongated in the snout anymore. But I mean, like, if of his different things, like the mimic, mm -hmm. uh, the oh. regular dog, the author, any of that stuff. I mean, I like this strip. I don't know if I'd want to make it like a huge part of, of the Snoopy story. Mm -hmm. The writer thing. Uh, favorite? My favorite? Yeah. Oh, definitely the vulture. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good pick. That's a, yeah, yeah. That's a good one too. That's, that's yeah. a solid that's, pick. That's, Harold, that's for me, it's got to be the Snoopy Joy Dance. That thing is just so sublime and only yeah. Schultz has pulled that off. I don't know why. But it's absolutely amazing that he was able to embody joy and Snoopy that way. My, what I'm going to say is going to sound like a pose, but I swear to God, this is true and has been true since I was a very little boy. It's the world famous grocery clerk. Oh, yes. I love the grocery <laughs> clerk. Going to do a little heavy reading tonight, sweetie. <laughs> and I would, when I was a grocery clerk, any person who bought a magazine, I'd say, going to do a little heavy reading tonight. <laughs> How'd they go over? I like that one. That's a good one. Uh, blank, you know. Like, uh, no. <laughs> mm. Well, I have something to look forward to. I don't. Know I think that. it's like oh. five strips. It's not too. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's such indelible part. It looks like 1975 or something. So we go. Yeah, we do have something to look forward to there. September 16th, 1966. Charlie Brown sits up in bed. He sniffs. I smell smoke. He says. Then he sniffs again. We cut to Snoopy outside who is kicking at Charlie Brown's door. Bam, 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 bam. Charlie Brown runs out to see what's the matter. What in the world, he says, as we see Snoopy looking off in dismay. Panel right. And then in the final panel, we see Snoopy's doghouse in flames. Charlie Brown is comforting Snoopy. He says, good grief. And Snoopy thinks to himself, my books, my records, my pool table, my Van Gogh. Sob. And that's the strip. All right, tell us about that. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind when I read this one is never mind rain. Schultz was uh, famously proud of how well he could draw rain. I think he draws fire really well. Yeah, that's good. Um, that was my first beautiful. Thought. That's the first Beyond panel that, of peanuts I ever saw. Was, wow. was wow. that? That is the cover. This stupid, this weird pop psychology book was the first time I saw peanut. I had probably seen the show, you know, Christmas and stuff, but the first strips I saw were in this book. What's it all about, Charlie Brown? And that is the cover image. That's a powerful image. So well, you, you have, so what you did have you think books. Peanuts was? If this is a, a person's first image of Peanuts, what do you possibly think that Peanuts is? Well, I mean, it certainly Based made me that. open the book. And I could read when yeah, I, I was very, very, very young because I had a, um, oh, what's it called? Um, overbearing Mother. And so I uh, <laughs> tried to read that book, even though it was really just like, late 60s pop psych gibberish but i couldn't make heads or tails out of most of that but i read all the strips and so i guess my impression would have been like oh this is something for really really smart people 
it would never have been like, oh, this is for kids for me. I mean, obviously, it certainly would would never be. Well, this looks like a yeah, this looks character. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that of being a being an author, William, that that two of the last panels of the five strips you picked are essentially covers of Peanuts books. Oh yeah, yeah. I I didn't do that on purpose, but yeah. How do you point that out? Um, I actually like this one because it is so different. The, the animation makes me think the animations again, the, the films. My personal favorite film that they did was Bon Voyage, Charlie Brown. And like that film, there's a fire in the film too, coincidentally. Like that film, this strip puts the Peanuts characters in a very different setting. And I like it when, I always liked it as a kid when my characters from shows or books or whatever that I read end up in a different place than I expect them to be. And I don't expect Charlie Brown and Snoopy to be uh, out here with a, a doghouse on fire. And I find that very striking and very interesting. So that's why I picked this one. It, it kind of moves Peanuts into the realm of what I think of like Tintin and Asterix, where there's high yeah. high comedy, there's real drama. You, there's some in, these introspective, well, more on Tintin's side, I guess, uh, introspective moments. But it's it's a rich world, and and Schultz kind of gets there with this with the strip. And certainly, this is an example of. You know, I can't imagine if I had seen this for the first time, you know, I would have thought it was, yeah, uh, much different than what I know yeah. it to be. If this is your first Peanut strip ever, uh, I don't know if you read a second one because uh, it is so heavy. But if you've been reading for a while and you know what the strip is and then you, you hit this thing all of a sudden um for me anyway i'm looking forward to the next day because i want to see yeah. well happens. i'm assuming i'm assuming this sequence ran for a while i think it did yeah do you, do you remember how it did it was there a happy ending <laughs> yes do you know uh, does anyone know what he replaced the van Gogh with what i actually was it the van the Wyeth? andrew wyeth yeah or, yeah uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they rebuilt the doghouse at last for, I think, a little over two weeks. And I'm not 100% certain, but Schultz had a fire at his house. Uh, okay, so it's another occasion. Where I'm assuming that, his yeah, that the, his, his home, home. Yeah. burned for, when well, tragically, actually, then recently, Mrs. Schultz's house uh, burned in those California yeah. wildfires. So, very sad. Right. Like, yeah, I'm well, this was um, my first strip, and clearly it had an impact because here I am today. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the uh, uh, the fun little bit where we get a, a, a peek or at least uh, hear about what Snoopy keeps in his doghouse. He's got books, he's got records, he's got a pool table, uh, he's got a Van Gogh. I'm sure there are probably references to what was in his doghouse before this, but uh, this was a, a, another occasion where you get that sort of peek into his life. Yeah, I'm trying the last strip I, of the story, I think it's people like, um, I th it's Snoopy standing outside and I think there's just voices coming from inside and people are mulling around or whatever. And he says, Oh, my Andrew Wyatt is going over big. Cause they're like, Oh, it's even nicer than the last <laughs> dog house. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's why I chose this. One. Well, that's, that's a great pick. And uh, again, really, really shows the range this guy was capable of. Absolutely. I kind of wonder if Schultz had tried to do a, a serious adventure script. Although now that I'm thinking about it, I think he did consider it. Oh, he uh, did. Well, launching one in the, in the early 50s. Well, this brings us to uh, one of my private theories, which came up actually in our last special episode with, with Lex. I see Peanuts as three comic strips, really. I see it as possibly okay. four. You could, it's good old Charlie Brown, Snoopy. Peppermint Patty, and then even possibly rerun. They, and if you look at them as ex having separate existences, mm -hmm. it almost yeah. makes more sense than them coming together. Uh, but they do come together beautifully. And I think in the Snoopy yeah. strip, that's where Schultz gets to indulge his desire to do an adventure strip. Because Snoopy can do all that stuff. Because all, it's not even just imagination, really, in Snoopy. Uh, the laws yeah. of physics change around Snoopy. Um, and then they change back when you're back in good old Charlie Brown. <laughs> right. Yeah. I can yeah. See so, that. I mean, he he's has, and he, he does pretty well with those longer continuities. I really enjoy a few of them. The only problem I ever have with them is uh, often, let's say, or let's say often, let's say now and again, he doesn't stick the landing. The last strip doesn't yeah. sometimes pay off. It does in this instance though. This is a, this is a great one. Yeah. yeah. September 5th, 1978. 
Lucy and Charlie Brown are outside at night looking up at the stars. Lucy says, Do you think you have a lucky star, Charlie Brown? Charlie Brown says, I don't know. Lucy says, I think you do, Charlie Brown. We see one shooting star streak across the sky. Well, fall to earth, actually. And Lucy says, and there it went. This one crashed Poor Charlie every, Brown. Every time I read it. <laughs> Poor Charlie Brown. Uh, it's This is a brutal strip. It's Lucy doing what Lucy does, uh, which is uh, crush Charlie Brown, basically. Right. I think throughout, not just the strip, but throughout Lucy and Charlie Brown's relationship, I think she does actually have his interests at heart. She just really can't help herself right. <laughs> from putting her thumb down on uh, what she perceives as a weaker person. Oh, I invite so you to contemplate doing, what the Van yeah, yeah. Pelt parents must be like. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't want to hang Absolutely. out at Linus and Lucy's. I'll take <laughs> Charlie Brown's barber dad any day of the week than whatever is going on in that house. <laughs> Agreed. I find that yeah, Schultz so. says that later on in his career he tried to make the characters less nasty. And this yep. is this strip is beyond my purview. This is 1978. So I'd never seen this one. But it seems to me Lucy is not trying to put him down. She's just saying he's unlucky. Right. Right. Yeah, I do yeah. think that's true. I mean, Lucy feels like she's just speaking truth. Yeah. which yeah. makes it all the more brutal in a way right. um she's not just being yeah. just being snide and saying hey i'm going to point out something that makes you feel bad that's like, I, I think that's how you are i mean it's how it comes across right. and in a way that's even tougher i'm fascinated by what you're saying william about how you, you think that lucy ultimately has charlie brown's best interests in, in heart based on who she is i think that's a really fascinating insight because uh lucy obviously we get all over 17,000 strips, we're going to get all sorts of different aspects of characters. But there is this strange through line that Lucy feels like she knows best. She knows better, not only for herself, but for others. And, you know, she's got the psychiatrist booth and she's, you know, there's a lot. But she, and she engages with Charlie Brown so much. And, you know, with Schroeder, she's infatuated. But with Charlie Brown, uh, sometimes he looks like a little bit of a, a project. For her, right. I mean, even maybe in some yeah. ways, even more so than Linus on a deeper level. Well, right. and if you assume that, that, and I have never thought about it that way, but if you assume that what William's saying is true, that accounts for why she's likable and Patty and Violet aren't. Yes. Right? Yeah, I like Patty and Violet. Well, yeah, we like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you wouldn't want to hang out with Patty and Violet. But I actually would be amused spending an hour with Liz. Hanging out with Violet. <laughs> Liz played Violet and your good Oh, that's Charlie right. Brown. Well, we do get to hang no. out with Patty. Oh, she played Patty. Oh, okay. Well, they're they're cut from the same cloth. <laughs> How dare you but, say such a thing? <laughs> They're two u- unique, distinct characters. This has been Unpacking Peanuts. We will never return again. <laughs> Sir. But Patty and Violet will say things specifically to, to be hurt mean. Him. To hurt him, whether it's true or not. They'll, they'll just express a thought just to crush him a little bit. Lucy is perfectly willing to crush somebody. But she comes at it from a, a, a point of view of, here, look, I'm helping you. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think she means it, even though clearly she's not. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like snapping yeah. him into reality or, yeah, there's, there's a lot yeah. of undercurrent there, even if she's like playing a dirty joke on him. I think that one, yeah. of, the, one, of, the, one of the strips that was turned into animation uh, on one of the podcasts you did that I was listening to uh, recently yeah. was, I think Lu- Lucy's like, oh, I think it was like the little redhead girls at the door. It's a beautiful girl. And Charlie Brown's what? And he runs to the, the door of his house and you know, no one there. And it's like an April Fool's joke. But yeah, it, it's it's almost like Lucy's like, I'm trying to help you get over yourself is kind of this feeling yep. you sometimes get this undercurrent, which is really, yeah, is is it's it, it's complex. And I, I think, yeah, I think you're right, William. There is something about her that uh is often unspoken, but it's felt uh that that there is something that is uh that there's that's redeem. I don't even say redeemable is the right word. It's just that she, her way of seeing the world, she's treating Charlie Brown with some sort of form of Lucy respect. Yeah. And the psychiatric yeah. booth is just the perfect way to show that 
She wants to help people by basically pointing out their faults. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. You know what? Well, this is really yeah. interesting. I, it, this is sort of unlocking some stuff about this character for me. This is, this is a really cool conversation. I think that is a, that's right. That is the perfect illustration of a person like that. Huh? Yeah. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and say it. This guy was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> he did he all, right. all right. You know, I'm also, boy, you can really see with these that you picked from look at that first one, all the way up to this 1978 one, the, the just change in Schultz's art. And even, you know, for me, having grown up with the seventies and eighties stuff, the seventies one looks a little strange having been so immersed in the fifties. Not to me. Oh. It's, I mean, it's, it's a change, but I don't think it's a drastic change at all with these two characters. Anyway, that is interesting. I would have thought you'd say the opposite, Michael. Yeah. Well, so when you when you look at these, because it's a night sky, that yeah, you really can't see the outline. Well, when oh, you that's look at these, William, based on your background, what what's which of the 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 visual styles just resonates with you the most? Oh, just later style. Um, this feels more like what I was looking at. So this last last trip from nineteen seventy eight. Yeah, we're well, we're maybe the the sixties ones, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. But yeah, probably more the seventy. I was, I wasn't alive in the sixties, so I wasn't reading it every day then. But in the seventies, I certainly was. And this, so this last strip, that's what I would have been seeing right. every day. That style. So that probably, to my mind, feels like okay, that's peanuts. That's what they look like. Interesting. Yeah. So, oh, beautiful. Stuff. Um, so nobody's gonna understand this if they don't listen to the other. Our other conversation on my show, but but Jimmy, so what I'm looking at here is this zipatone stuff on the. Uh, no, that's that's just white okay. uh, white paint. I will say that we were talking on the other, or maybe it wasn't even on air. Maybe it was before we started recording about how it's okay to criticize someone even if they're a genius. And the one yeah. thing Schultz never did well were stars in the sky. I mean, the the early ones, it <laughs> looks like he's applying them with a house painting brush. And and it's like the one thing that makes anything look cool is you put stars on a black yeah. and it'll always look good. It, his looks always like polka dots to me. So maybe he's not. Wow, what a hack. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, he's good at rain, good at rain, good at fire. Not so great with stars. Well, this is a brush, though. Yeah, it is a brush. Yeah. It? And also it looks like the whiteout in her hair is a brush. Yeah. Yeah. You mean in the first two panels? Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. So you you think that he he drew everything black and then created the white versus leaving the space white in the first place and never putting well, ink on it? Either way, it's with the brush, right? Because he's either I don't know. Well, he's he's either inking in the black with a brush and leaving those white, you know, untouched, or he's going back in with a brush and painting the white in. You didn't have a sharpie. I mean, he's not using white media with a with a pen. I don't think. He's, I mean, like on Violet, the very first strip, the back of her head. I mean, that totally looks brushed to me, but. Oh yeah. yeah, I no, I think there's entire strips in the early '50s where he was using a brush, or really? or yeah. using one of those really flexible gelat pen nibs, something like that. I really do, especially when you look in like the books, like um, that I can't think of the name of it ever, the Chip Kid book, where it has a bunch of the original art blown up fairly big, and it, it looks a little more brushy to me. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> William, this has been fantastic. This was a great, great conversation. Can you just uh, anything else you want to promote or plug? Obviously, we want everybody who listens to our podcast to listen to your podcast. You will not be disappointed, yeah. folks. It's called It's the so Podcast, we, Charlie we, Brown. Tell people. And we want them to listen to that show and only that show and your yes. show. No other. <laughs> no, because now the door is closed. <laughs> I'm sorry. That 18 year old is just out of luck. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I, I want to thank you guys for letting me come here uh, today. This has been a lot of fun. I like revisiting these strips. Uh, I am tempted now to, when we're done here, go find five more just for myself mm -hmm. uh, and play the same game. Where I, uh, I pick out five more favorites because uh, uh, Peanuts is just fun stuff. Anybody who wants to know anything about me, about uh, its podcast, Charlie Brown, my other show, Atari Bytes, books that I've written, they are available to own for your very own. Carnivalofbleecreations.com is my website. All of that stuff is on there. I hope that uh, uh, people have enjoyed what I've talked about today. Uh, and if not, come listen to my show and maybe you'll like that better. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know what? I will send you a, a link to some pictures of Zipatone. <laughs> awesome, because clearly I'm still confused uh, by this. And 
and uh, it's frustrating me a little. So I would appreciate that. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for, for being a part of our show. Yes. yes. And thank, thank you, you so all. Much, You're a good thank man, you. William Pepper. <laughs> oh, really? Thank you, Do you gentlemen. have anybody uh, in your family yes. in the military? And have they at ever at any point been a sergeant? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm glad I My, don't uh, have your last name because I would have had to gone into some <laughs> career where I could be a sergeant and never progress from that would be it. My, uh, I do not. Uh, my, I had a teacher in school who liked to call me Sergeant Pepper, oh, well, all the time, but I am not actually a, a military, <laughs> uh, active military. So. Well, guys, thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. If you want to follow us, you can check us out on the social media. We're Unpack Peanuts on both Instagram and Twitter. And you can uh, also check in on our website, unpackingpeanuts.com, where you can vote for Strip of the Year and listen to the podcasts and uh, learn a little bit about Michael Harold and I. And also, if you wanted to, not saying you have to, but if you wanted to, you could buy us a mud pie or maybe buy uh, one of our books. And that'll help keep this podcast going. Other than that, you just have a good week. We'll see you next week. For Michael and Harold, I'm Jimmy. Be of good cheer. Yes, yes be, of be good of good cheer. cheer. Unpacking Peanuts is copyright Jimmy Gownley, Michael Cohen, and Harold Buckholtz. Produced by Liz Sumner. Music by Michael Cohen. Additional voiceover by Aziza Shakrala Clark. For more from the show, follow Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Twitter. For more about Jimmy, Michael, and Harold, visit unpackingpeanuts.com. Have a wonderful day. And thanks for listening. Yeah.